so, last week, I was sitting here, and Chris announced that we're in the summer, we're going to go through the parables. And then I thought he said, we're going to do the parable of prodigal son every week. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Did he say yeah. that? Yes. He said, all right. Oh, he's going to be so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, he's not here. <laughs> luckily, yeah, he took that out of coward. Yeah. Right. I went ahead and picked a different one. So there you go. Is that all right? Born to be wild. Born to be wild. <laughs> well, it's still in the parables. It's not real wild. Okay, so Mark chapter 12. Um, it, any of you ever grow up with the idea that Jesus was a you know a good person and a, and a good teacher and, yeah. and kind of a loving, gentle person and all that? Well, it's all dashed today. <laughs> he doesn't come across very kind, nice, um, gentle, or even actually a very good teacher. Um, Parables chapter 12 of uh, Mark. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, but they seized him, beat him, and sent him home empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man in the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, Surely they'll respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be all ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will kill every one of those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it's marvelous to our eyes. The people he was telling this to, they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he'd spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. That's a little harsh, isn't it? We'd better pray. Lord, teach us from your word, teach us from this uh, parable, and help us to see you for who you are, and help us to see us for who we are. And show us how we might live uh, with confidence and with joy uh, because of you. That's our need today, in Jesus' name. So all of a sudden Jesus gets tough and you go, where did this come from? You know, I heard about, you know, the lost sheep and you go out and find them and a lady sweeping the house trying to find the lost coin and everybody has a party. Whoa, what happened here? There's no party. Uh, it's kind of bleak. Well, if you look at the end of chapter 11, uh, one of the things that's happening is, is that the religious leaders have started to gather around Jesus and they're challenging his authority. By what authority do you do these things? And there's a little game going back and forth. There's really a power struggle. And, uh, and in response to this rejection of his authority, he comes back with this, this story, this parable of the tenants in the vineyard. Now, um, it's interesting because I, when he started saying it, I could just imagine them going, oh, this is nice, it's a little Bible study, because he's almost quoting word for word from Isaiah chapter 5, which is talking about the details of building a vineyard. And, you know, with Westfall Winery down in San Diego, <laughs> my brother's winery, we, you know, I, I know a little bit about that. You know, they have to dig and dig and work and run. It's basically farming. It's not glamorous. Uh, it's farming with a tasting room is basically what this <laughs> is, you know. But... <clears throat> Uh, but he even goes into detail about how they uh, made room for the wine press and they dug a, a trench for that and they put up a watchtower. Anyway, he goes through all these details, which is right out of Isaiah 5. So the religious leaders are all going, well, this is nice. He's going to give us a little Bible study. Isn't that quaint? Because in Isaiah, uh, the uh, comparison is made that the vineyard that's being built is the people of God. 
God's people. And, and, and this, as this vineyard grows and uh, becomes fruitful, so the people become fruitful. So he's thinking, they're thinking, oh, it's nice that Jesus is going to be talking about us um, in the, among the people of God, among the vineyard. I was actually, I was talking to my brother a while back. I thought, you know, maybe we should do a book together. He's a pagan, you know, total pagan. And, uh, and but probably much more. <laughs> and uh, we have a lot in common. And uh, I was going to do it from one side of the book would be building, a, uh, planting a new church. And then from the other side, planting the vineyard and see the, all the uh, things that he goes through, uh, pests and blights, and then <laughs> pests and blights in the church, you know, <laughs> same, you know, <laughs> disasters, bad crops, you know. <laughs> And uh, uh, and see if we could meet in the middle somewhere, but that never actually happened. So just us, just nothing to do with anything. So, um, <clears throat> but here's what happens in this parable: it moves from being a nice little Bible study to suddenly becoming a very strong indictment, um, indicting the people who are uh, left to tend the people of God left to care for and nurture the vineyard of God. So he's saying, you know, here's what happens. You know, the vineyard's built, uh, the owner goes away, and his tenants are in charge. And then bad things start to happen. Now, we go from, you know, beating up somebody, the owner's representative, to uh, humiliating them, to uh, killing them, and uh, on and on. And uh, it keeps escalating. And I thought, well, wait a minute. You got to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Um, maybe they weren't uh, bad people. Maybe they just misunderstood a little bit, you know? And said so maybe they were thinking, you know, working in the vineyard, you know, we've been entrusted with this, it's our responsibility, and uh, why, you know, we have a relationship with the, with the owner, why doesn't the owner come here? How come he sends to somebody else, you know? Uh, that's not very respectful. Actually, we're being dissed by the owner, really, by having a son come, you know. And uh, so there's probably justification there. But it really strikes me that they, like us, are kind of slow learners. Um, they didn't catch on, did they? Um, and how many times do we struggle in our life trying to figure out, okay, so what does it mean uh, to be God's people? What does it mean to, to have a relationship with Christ in this world? What's it mean that God has authority in this world? What does it mean that he has authority in our lives? What, what does it mean, you know, we have all these questions, and for me, I, I've spent way too many years trying to figure that out. And I'll probably keep on going, uh, maybe the rest of my life. Uh, what does it mean? Lord, what are you trying to say? And, and, and I find myself making the same mistakes over and over again, sometimes escalating the mistakes. Am, am I alone in this? Yeah, yes. you guys all perfect learners. You get it you know, right there, pretty much. Well, so I was drawn to this article um, from the paper in Yate, England. Uh, a lovely driver gets her driver's license after 27 years and 1,800 driving lessons. 27 years, 10 instructors, many of whom passed away. <laughs> Not while she's driving, I hope, but you don't know. 1,800 driving lessons and $30,000 in fees. Sue Evan Jones has qualified for her driver's license. She said she didn't quite believe it Wednesday when the examiner told her she passed. Are you sure? <laughs> it's difficult to accept that I had actually done it, she said. Previous instructors over the years had discouraged her from even trying. On one attempt, she hit the clutch instead of the brake and plowed into a construction site. On another attempt, she pulled out in front of a police car that was trying to pass her with lights flashing and sirens blaring. <laughs> Her husband, David Evan Jones, a police traffic control officer, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> said his wife's problem was a desperate fear of crashing. <laughs> she was on her way. <laughs> the instructor said she's a lovely driver. 
the citizens of Yate can feel quite confident. I think, you know, that's kind of a picture of some of us trying to figure out what God's doing in our life. What, you know, it's cost a lot, a lot of lessons, and a lot of sermons, and a lot of Bible study groups, and a lot of songs, and, you know, and a lot of ministry efforts, and, and we're going along, and we're still wondering, so what's God want to have happen here? What's God up to here? How might we respond to God's authority here? And honestly, we've crashed a few times, haven't we? We pulled out in front of the police cars sometimes, spiritually speaking, you know, because um, we're slow learners. Now, when I look at this uh, parable, I think, okay, sin. What, what, what was these people's sin, these tenant farmers? What was it that made them react the way they do? to the owner of the vineyard. What makes them uh, so destructive in their lives? Um, and so I'm gonna, um, as I'm prone to do, I need to find, well, okay, see this this uh, little stand here? How many, how many feet does it have on it? Three. Three, three. okay, so this is a three-footed uh, music stand. <laughs> okay. That's your visual image, since I don't know how to write on the board anymore. Um, so there's three elements of the sin that I, I see in this parable. The, the first one is obvious, and that's pride. They're, they seem to have this sense of pride that they want to they want to look they want to look like they're in charge. They want to look like oh, they're prosperous. They have this vineyard they've been working on, and the people of the community have seen them working on it, and they've forgotten the owner who built it has gone away. And, and now they, their image and their posing in the community is very important. And so uh, part of their sin is trying to protect how they look and what people will think of them. Nobody wants to be seen as a tenant farmer, by the way. That's not all that great. Um, it's okay, but it's not all that great. Every tenant farmer wishes they had the land themselves. And every farmer, owner, wants to sell it. It's just the way it is, you know. Um, but the pride of how we look, how we'll appear to others, what people will think of us, that is just so deep into our reactions and our and our sin. The second uh, foot of the stand, though, is greed. So you have this pride of how we look, but then there's greed of, um, I, I want to possess this. And whenever greed rises up, it's always about getting a hold of something possessing it. It's not enough to, to be able to use it. It's not enough to, to be able to uh, admire it or enjoy it. It's, it's the possession of it. It's kind of like, uh, that is, you kids won't understand this, but a Mick Jagger said, under my thumb. He's talking about his girlfriend. Under my thumb. I'm not going to sing like Nick, but you know. <laughs> under my thumb. But the idea of possession, of, of control, that's, that's the greed. Uh, you have to have the right thing and it has to be yours and it's not enough that somebody else is enjoying it and it's not enough that you're enjoying it if somebody else has it. It's, it's I have to have it. And uh, you know, this comes out for me because I, you know me, uh, I'm terrible to go to restaurants with. I, Eileen's kind of given up on that. She and Damien go out, you know, spaghetti factory or something, and uh, they leave me at home because I have the Last Supper syndrome, which is a greed incarnate, which is I, I, I go in and I sit down and I look at the menu and then I look over at the specials, you know, to see when you come in, and then I, go, and then I start talking to the waitress uh, or the waiter about what they recommend, knowing that they have different tastes than me, and whatever they recommend is probably wrong for me. I don't care. I got to know what's the best. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <clears throat> have to have the best, whatever it is. And 
it's gotten me in trouble. I mean, because sometimes, you know, then the food comes and I go, oh, I wanted that. <laughs> mine doesn't look so good. Can we switch? Can we share? I'll take yours, you take mine, and we'll share. <laughs> you know? Or then all of a sudden something's delivered to a table over there, and it's like, oh, well, wait, 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 what did they get? <clears throat> I'm terrible. It got me in trouble. I, I think I told you about this once in Guatemala. We were visiting missionaries. I took them out to dinner at this really nice restaurant on the lake in uh, central Guatemala. And I told the translator, I'm going to order the food for everyone tonight in Spanish. <laughs> so I heard everything's going along good. The translator's sitting next to me, sweating. <sighs> Finally, I come to take an order for dessert. And I've been working on this in my head, working on it. And I go, bring us for dessert. We want the best. We want to eat the best dessert. The whole restaurant went <coughs> silence. Everyone turned and stared at me. Oh. The, the waiter had this rage in his eyes. And I looked at the, Jim Vasquez, my friend and translator, and I said, did I do something wrong? You just said, bring me your wife. I want a woman for dessert. <laughs> when I realized that mujer and mayor are very similar <laughs> words. Very similar. And yet it made a big difference. <laughs> we were not treated well the rest of the evening. <laughs> but I have to have the best. You know? It's gotten me in trouble. That's, that's the greed. It's not enough to just have good. I want to possess it. I can't enjoy what you're having unless I take it from you, see? And so you have the pride of how we appear and, and control of our exterior, but then we also have the control and, and the ownership and the possession that comes with the greed. The third foot of this uh, podium, this beautiful pulpit, <laughs> metallic pulpit, is uh, envy. Envy. Now, envy is a very strange one. Bono said that the difference between Irish people and American people is that American will see the big house on the hill and say, someday I'll have a house like that. He said, in Ireland, we look at the big house on the hill and say, someday I'm going to burn that thing down. <laughs> <laughs> So we have pride, we have envy, uh, the resentments that come with it, uh, we have the greed of wanting to control. And those three swirl around as they did with the tenant farmers, and they swirl and they swirl, and they, and they catch us up in the whirlpool, and it pulls us down. And th this is the essence of sin. Now, how do we stop that? How do we get out of that whirlpool? How do we get out of the pull down into sin that, that they're experiencing here? And, and, it, and this parable really is the essence of this. It comes down to stewardship. Isn't that weird? The antidote for our sin is stewardship. That seems weird. Because we've trivialized stewardship. We go, well, that's taking an offering. Uh, you know, that's stewardship, being a good steward. Actually, it's so much more than that because in, in stewardship, we acknowledge that we're not the owner. It's not ours. We acknowledge that we're the uh, caretakers or the tenant farmers. We don't deny it. We don't pretend to be something else. We don't, we don't go, you know, hey, this is all mine. Because when we say this is all mine, that's when we start falling into our sin. The freedom to say, there's two things I know. There's a God and I'm not God. Two things, right? And we should all be able to say that confidently every morning under the mirror. There is a God, I'm not him. Okay? That's what stewardship is. Say, okay, 
the Lord has entrusted us, has given us so much blessing to, to enjoy, to uh, utilize, to use for his purposes. If our attitude changed to that of steward rather than envy, pride, greed, we suddenly become free. We, we suddenly become freed up from uh, having to look a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain way because stewardship is not just about uh, are you tithing 10% of, of your income to the Lord? It, it's, it's about do you have a right relationship with God? That's what stewardship is. Do you have a right relationship with the owner of the vineyard? Because out of that comes an amazing uh, abundance. Really. We stop worrying about if we have enough. We stop worrying about what somebody might do. You know, a person who, who is caught in the sin cycle, pride, greed, envy, you know, they're never at ease because they always have to be on guard in case they might lose something or someone might take it away or it might go bad. Some, you know, so you have to always be on guard. Muhammad Ali said, when, when you're the heavyweight champion of the world, you never know peace. There's always somebody coming up who wants to take that away from you. But when we grasp that we're the tenants, caretakers, all of a sudden, uh, we break the cycle of the pride and the greed and the envy. Because we know who we are. Now what does stewardship give to us? Uh, a couple things. Stewardship gives to us something that's needed that we don't always seek that we, it's needed. And that is, it gives us a, a accountability. It, it tells us that what happens to us matters to someone else. What happens to them matters to us, right? We're accountable to each other. Um, not just to stop doing bad stuff, but also to start doing uh, fun stuff. It works both ways, right? We need to be in an accountable relationship to people who tell us to lighten up, not just bear down harder. Now, uh, along with the accountability though, stewardship also gives us um, confidence. We have confidence. like. Uh, the verse I want uh, tattooed on my forehead at my funeral, um, or, you know, I used to say on my gravestone, but they don't have those anymore so much, so now I'm just going to get a tattoo on my forehead with this verse. I am confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I'm confident, first of all, that God began a good work in us, and second, he'll bring it to completion. And so uh, we have accountability, and then we also that we matter, and they matter, and we're in this together. And then, and then we have confidence that God's up to something far bigger than what we're thinking. And the last one: discovering stewardship um, results in our feeling fulfilled. Hunger's getting met. Restlessness gets settled. Um, the need to protect ourselves goes away. The need to present ourselves in certain ways disappears. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, uh, there's a sense of fulfillment and contentment and uh, my life is good. And we can be grateful. That comes out of stewardship. See, it's the antithesis of pride and envy and greed. Now the twist of, of this uh, parable is that, you know, you go through it and you go, okay, we're the tenant farmers, yeah, I get that, okay, and we're taking care of the farm, we're taking care of the vineyard for the Lord, okay, I get that. Um, uh, we need to give back to the Lord, you know, the people coming to get their share of the crops, that's, I get that, okay. 
But there's a, one other element, and that is that once we acknowledge and accept the right relationship that we're the tenant farmer, God turns it over and says, you're also the heir. You're also the one I love. You're also my beloved child. But we only get that when we accept that we're not the creator, that we're not God. There's whole, uh, you know, Seattle and the Northwest, there's whole religious orders <laughs> based on uh, drawing out the God within you, you know. It's, there's an endless, endless amount of seminars you can go on that and, and uh, New Age bookstores you can go through that talk about, you know, we're going to bring the God in you out, you know. Which is just the opposite of this. This is when we, when we embrace the right relationship with God, that he made us for his purposes, and, and we're not him. We're here to care and, and to serve. That we discovered that we're his children. We're the ones he loves. And there's nothing in the world more that God's more focused on than what you're dealing with. What concerns you concerns the Lord. Because he loves you. What you struggle with, the Lord wants to struggle with you, alongside you. Yeah. The, the three-footed uh, pulpit, you know, envy, <coughs> greed, what was this one? Pride. Pride. Actually, it, it looks really stable. You build your life on it, but it's not. Um, it's a funny thing. <laughs> That's what our life's like when we stand on that. But a life in stewardship, discovering we're God's children and the ones He loves, that's solid. That's God's work to you. Pray with me, Lord. We ask for your presence and your power. And we ask for a right relationship with you. One that, that will withstand the storms and the struggles. And one, Lord, that we can grow in confidence and accountability and in love. Help us to see you in, in fresh eyes and help us to see ourselves through your eyes. In Jesus' name.